Thank you very much, and I'm quite tempted to react on uh, your presentation, which was very uh, insightful and, and interesting, but um, instead of that, I would like to open the floor for uh, quick, short, uh, clarifying questions and remarks on a first-come-first-serve basis, so the first, let's say, three questions uh, can be posed. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is David Zarek. I do a blog called The Risk Monger. Uh, last year, I showed that the EFSA uh, B working group, uh, risk assessment B working group, of the five members, two of the members had no experience in B field trials. Two others, Gerard Arnold for, uh, from Apamondia and uh, Fabio Seglosta, were running campaigns, uh, who was running campaigns for a pesticide action network, I had obvious conflicts of interest. The B res risk assessment working group. Uh, wrote the B risk guidance document, which has unvalidated all of the industry research. What I know we're here to bash industry, and it's good fun, but what is EFSA's position when NGOs or activists are on the working groups and influencing the science there? Thank you. Other questions or remarks? Yes, Mr. Millstone. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Eric Milton from the University of Sussex, and my question is one for Heber de Leica at EFSA. Um, because one of the topics we were discussing yesterday was about the relationship between risk assessment bodies and risk management bodies. EFSA is supposed to do risk assessment, and risk management is now in the hands of Digisante at the Commission. But before EFSA was set up, I was doing some work for the European Parliament. And I was talking to a, one of the officials in what was then DG Sanko about how they envisaged the relationship between the Commission and EFSA. And the official came up with a curious remark. The person said, oh, we in the Commission, we will want EFSA to be independent but not out of control. <laughs> now, <laughs> that puzzled me because, of course, one of the problems in regulatory policy is often that policymakers decide what the policy will be and then seek advice to support the policy they've already decided. So I'm puzzled about the way in which the Commission might seek to exercise control over EFSA. And I have in front of me on my screen, on my laptop, EFSA's establishment plan. This, this one's a bit out of date, it's 2013, but I know I've looked at the more recent one and it's not very different. And so for uh, senior scientific staff, in 2013, there were a total of 351 people employed, of whom the number with permanent posts was five. So my question is, is the commission exerting control over EFSA by keeping people on temporary contracts rather than giving them security of employment. I think those remarks went mostly to uh, EFSA, so let's start with uh, Mr. Deleike. Um We're used to this. Um, <laughs> on, on the permanent employment, uh, um, the rules for um, temporary agents, which we are indeed, uh, we have five-year contracts, allow to uh, give permanent employment after 10 years. Now, us being in such a young agency, of course, that's only uh, the case for a limited uh, number of staff. Um, I don't know if you want to widen the discussion, uh, but I think um, it is true that the essence is the independence of the scientific advice. We did not decide, it was the European institutions that decided that the number of staff in EFSA and in other agencies, maybe with the exception of Frontex, I imagine, is being systematically reduced over time. So um, those are uh, issues that one has to keep in mind. Where are the limitations of this notion of independence, which uh, you raise indeed? Um, if I may then, for the continuing on the pet subject of independence, um, um, I, 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 I think we uh, may have an amalgamation of a number of issues. I've heard this morning board membership. 
Um, the chair of our board is indeed uh, also somebody with an interest, uh, um, since she's uh, um, uh, employed by a consumer industry. I didn't hear you mention that, but it is true that, and more importantly, that the selection of the board is, of course, none of the business of the EFSA staff. It's uh, determined by uh, the institutions that we were referring to earlier. Does one seek to change that? Um, then, uh, of course, that's a decision that uh, we will take note of. Other times I've heard things being mentioned like the famous hearing experts. For God's sakes, we've had hearing experts in place for a long time. Let's not make the recommendation to EFSA that we need hearing experts. We use them indeed. Um, I think also we may have gross <coughs> exaggerations. To, to hear publicly say, Marta, that 50% of the experts have conflicts of interest, I, th I think it's, I mean, it's the privilege of you being able to say that in a democracy. I, I, I have the privilege to say that I think this is a gross exaggeration. But I think w it is true, like you make the point, that we have a budget of about seven million to invest in um, training of experts, uh, our activities with member states. So it is true that if we want to train our experts, we have to rely again on member state institutions to partner with us because the resources that we have available are indeed uh, quite limited. Above and beyond all that, I've tried through a series of slides to say, please, can we elevate the debate to the subject and not only talk about the pianist or the, the ones that are writing, but to make sure that the process is transparent, that its process is reproducible. It will, as uh, Noel demonstrated, for one application, which is the clinical data, it, it requires an enormous investment, and I'm making the point Let's try to uh, share the burden of these tasks a little bit between agencies. Thank you. Uh, and now, uh, our other two speakers also can react on each other or questions from the uh, audience. So, Martin. Um, I will start answering the question that was asked to me by, by Paul. Uh, and the question was, how balanced is this debate? Uh, because indeed, you seemed to complain that we were mainly talking about the conflicts of interest with industry and not with NGOs. That was the sense of the other question. Um, the title of the conference is How to Escape Regulatory Capture. If you look at the scientific liter literature on the topic, it's like 98% on industry regulatory capture. Uh, we have talked a bit, we have asked questions actually, notably to Mrs. Uh, Naomi Oreskes yesterday, that, for example, to what extent did NGOs use tactics of like uh, doubt mongering tactics and stuff? And her response was, well, as far as I'm aware, there's really not much to be seen. Um, she's a scientist, I'm not. Uh, I'm a researcher, but I'm an, I'm an activist at the same time. So. That's the, the first, uh, that's the first observation. The second observation is about the parallel that you draw between, uh, well, why should experts from you know, Boeing be excluded from uh, uh, assessing the risk of planes or the experts from Mercedes excusing the risk of cars? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in, in case you didn't get that, but at the end of uh, my presentation, uh, and as we heard again, we have a tool that already exists that is called the hearing expert, and that enables agencies to access any, uh, any knowledge they have. Uh, it's not a matter of excluding people, it's a matter of regulating interest in a way that this doesn't impair an institution's independence. It's a different topic, it's more difficult, it is more technical, uh, but it is nonetheless independent. It, it is uh, certainly not less independent. As far as the uh, po uh, alleged conflicts of interest of the working group on EFSA's big guidance, I don't know, I haven't studied the topic, uh, so I cannot answer to this question. Uh, and that's it for me. Okay, Mr. Leonard. I'm not sure there's a lot that I can <coughs> respond to that. Um, I think I've said what I had to say and I don't actually have any other questions for, for the panel. Mm. Okay, um, well, we have Two additional questions, very short. Okay, so please uh, be really quick. Yeah, uh, I'm afraid for EFSA again. With the Commission's new <coughs> policy of 450 euros per diem for 
scientific experts. Uh, is there any reaction from ESSA thinking to do the same thing? Okay, and the next one. This is Martin from Pan Europe. As we were cited, I just wanted to clarify that we never paid any expert working on the big di guidance document at EFSA. Uh, this is one thing. And second thing, uh, we are trying to work with independent experts who just try to increase the amount of scientific knowledge. Um, and uh, luckily now they also work for EFSA because they don't have any ties with the pesticide industry. So that's normal that sometimes Pan-Europe will cite the same experts as the one who are working for EFSA if they are independent. Yeah, um, uh, thanks indeed. Uh, now, the, the, the amounts that you're citing are, are relevant, of course. Uh, please keep in mind that most of the money that is paid to the experts goes actually back to the institutions that are sending these experts these days. So we've, we've, we've had an economic crisis, we've uh, faced issues there, so um, I, I think luckily I would argue it's amazing what we have been able to achieve with these people being indeed paid little or, or a little more than little. I, I'd like to make one comment, uh, if I may, uh, Chair. I, I would like to argue that EFSA is not the EFSA employees. It's you all. You are the owners of EFSA. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I'm, uh, I've been invited to join the Chinese Food Safety Authority's uh, advisory committee. And I thought, well, what are we to do there? And they said, well, could you please keep in mind that the role of EFSA goes way beyond the borders of Europe, you're setting standards worldwide. So I would plead, we are very open to criticism and you know it. We're trying to adjust, we're trying to do what we can with the means that we have, but please give us your support as well. Yeah, I think it's an important message and we do our best. But here, because of the lack of time, I would um, finalize this panel uh, say, uh, with saying thank you for all of our three speakers to contribute to this uh, uh, discussion. Uh